sunshine in your smile bring me laughter all the while bring me fun bring me sunshine bring me love sweet love bring me fun bring me sunshine Good evening, good evening ladies and gentlemen, have we got a show for you tonight? Have we got a show for them tonight? Yes we have, fantastic. Morecambe and Wise were at their peak 30 years ago, and the best of their comedy is as funny now as it was then. Tonight we'll be looking at some of their best remembered moments, as well as more obscure pieces that nevertheless deserve to be recognised as the classics they are. Take a look at this. <laughs> I've got to tell you, right. Well, there's been a mistake. A mistake? Where? Yeah. Uh, you got my pants on. You, I've got your trousers on. You got my trousers on. Well, what are you doing wearing my trousers? Well, it wasn't to do, nothing to do with me. No. In the quick change room, you were too quick. Oh, well, Let's look, go off and get changed. Come, look, on. Look, come on. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't do it. That's murder. That we is. haven't got time for that. Why not? Well, we've got to do the show in two minutes. Get him off now and change. Come on. <laughs> Suffering as it is. Well, you can't take him off in front of the ladies and gentlemen. What are we going to do? We got the wrong. <sighs> I've got it. What? I tell you what. I figured it out. You stay here. Yeah. Tell them all about the show and leave everything to me. All right. And do as you're told. All right. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, this is a special production. How are you doing it now? Yeah, I'm telling him. Oh. I'm telling him. Yeah. I can't hear a word. Do you? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I was saying, it's a special production. <laughs> What's going on back there? More than what's going on in front, I'll tell you. It's smiling, isn't it? Right. The things you say, yes. Right, look at that. What? See? What? Now, see that? Yes. Now, as far as they're concerned, yeah. they think that I'm wearing a full suit. But I'm not. You're not? Because I've got that. <laughs> that. That. A spare leg. A spare leg. Now, what I want you to do, yes. if you will, yeah. is whip a spare leg into there. <laughs> You've got a spare leg. Well, don't just stand there. Find one. Find one. Yes. All right. Wait a minute. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> Won't take very long. You ready? Yes. You see, now what he's going to do, I hope, is he's going to whip a spare leg into there. Yes. <laughs> whip a spare leg into there. That's where that. he's going. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Oh, right. Oh, right. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him, I'm too close. Now, what? You should now have another spare leg. <laughs> another spare leg for me. I've got one there. Look. Have you got one? Yes. Right. Drop it on the floor. All right. That's a good one. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> there you are. Yes. Now then. Right. Take it all easy, nice and casual. Yes. Relaxed. You see what I mean? Now you turn around. This one, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter which way we turn. Doesn't matter which way we turn. We've got our own suits on. That's right. So we can start the show now. Yes, yeah, start the show. Start the show and walk off very slowly. Why? It brings the tears to my eyes. All right. <laughs> that was Eric and Ernie in 1970, and it demonstrates their remarkable physical timing and just how well they work together. That kind of understanding can only be developed by years of performing in front of a live audience. That was partly the secret of their success. They started very young. They were both child performers. Ernie toured the clubs of Leeds with his dad when he was just seven years old. Here he is dressed as Charlie Chaplin. And here is a caricature of Eric Bartholomew, which was Eric Morecambe's real name. When the boys were 12 years old, they formed a double act. Soon they were separated by World War II, but a chance meeting reunited them. We weren't working together, and I joined the circus as a straight man to a comedian who I didn't know. And when I got there, it was Ernie. Yeah, I was a straight man to Ernie. Throughout the 1950s, they built their reputation as a live act. Although they made a disappointing television series in 1954 called Running Wild, they never stopped working as a live variety act. They were never shy about their influences. But did you ever consciously uh, base the act on any other act? Yeah. Albert and Costello was our original. Yeah. 
That's where we, I've got records at home of Ernie and I of early broadcasts where we were. I'm a bad boy. <laughs> Yes. You know the guy's name? I'm telling you their names. Who's on first? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The guy on first. Who? The guy on first. Who is on first? What are you asking me for? I'm asking you. You ain't telling me nothing. I'm asking you who's on first. That's it. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first base. That's his name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who is on first? What are you asking me? Other influences were much closer to home. Here's veteran comedian Sandy Powell in the 1970s. Don't interfere, please. Every man to his own trade. I'm talking to my little friend. Now, tell me, Sonny, was your father a soldier? Oh, no. He was a little soldier. <laughs> yes, I don't eat meat either. And when he joined the army, have it wrong, thing. I said, I don't eat meat either. Meat? No. We're not talking about meat. We're talking about his father. Oh, no. Well, he said his father was a vegetarian. No, no, what he said. <laughs> and here is Eric and Ernie's version. Oh, what are you going to do for us tonight, Charlie? Well, first of all, I thought I'd tell you a few jokes. Take all my clothes off and show you my bare wooden Just a moment, just a moment. Just a moment. I, uh, I can see your lips moving. I said, I can see your lips moving. Well, of course you can, you fool. Because it's me who's doing it for him. He can't do it on his own, he's wood. That's me hand there, you know. I'm working with an amateur. Do you not, sir? God, that's murder. You're not supposed to move your lips. Ventriloquists don't move their lips. I mean, that's the whole idea. When the dummy talks, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Hello, Charlie. How are you? <laughs> Tonight, we have a glittering parade of guest stars direct from stage, screen and job centre. To discuss with me the finer points of Morecambe and Wise's oeuvre. Can I say that oeuvre? I'm looking it up. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a very warm welcome to Mr. Eddie Izzard. Eddie, um, um, you're a big fan of Morecambe and Wise, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> now, they, they sort of, um, you're known, um, I don't want to put you in a box, but you're known as a surrealist comic. Yeah. Um, and do you mind being called a surrealist? No, I think that's great. I think that's, I mean, you know, we share, you did everything on, on your show that I would have hoped to have done. So, yes, um, yes. So, just going off on Wild Flights of Fantasies, very, uh, fantasies, uh, very influenced by Python. Mm -hmm. And I, I always thought Eric Morecambe was doing stuff that was just out of the box and in stand-up terms you know he was he's just going in different directions it's, mm. it's, it's, mm. it's beautiful mm. well let's have a look we've got to, to carry on the ventriloquist theme from the from the clips we saw earlier here's a, a little bit of eric and ernie being quite surreal we did a, a thing uh, a year about a year 18 months ago it was a thing called oggy that we had the enormous dummy a 12-foot dummy yeah. and i was this ventriloquist with a 12-foot dummy and i think we went through that once yes. didn't we when you get a piece that like that all. you can't it's got to play with the audience it can only depend on what your audience give you for a thing like that. Yes. <laughs> what do you call him? Pardon? What do you call him? Hoggy. Oh, Hoggy. And he's solid oak. Solid oak? Yeah, I made him myself. Did you? You really? know that bit clearing yeah. in Epping Forest? Mm -hmm. Tim. No. <laughs> Excuse me. How about that? 600 squiddles without horns now. No. But and then... his pockets are full of nuts. No. <laughs> can you work it? Pardon? <laughs> I said, can you work it? How do you mean? How do you mean? Make it talk. Ha! Ah, well, I don't know. I've never tried because when he's up straight, you see. Yeah. When he's up straight. Yeah. I can't get my hand on his thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that you've got to pull to make to make his mouth work. You mean the strings at the back. That's a that's a bit of a strain for me, that you see. Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you'll have to do something about it, won't you? What can I do? Here, I sit on that chair. Lovely. And let him lean right. over you. But that's it. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Now you can get your hand on the back. Hey, wait a minute. He's getting a bit heavy for me. He's heavy. You see, I'm only. So, 
Oh. Although they were very meticulous about rehearsing stuff, in scenes like that, as they were saying, there's a lot that you can't rehearse because of the, the, the dummy and stuff. I want to ask you, Eddie, about the, the way that you work on stage, because you ad-lib a lot on stage, don't you? What's yes. your working method? Uh, working method for, for an individual, it's interesting, because I double act, and I was a double act beforehand. Uh -huh. And uh, my individual method is just to, uh, for improvising, is keep the gate open and you talk and then you just keep talking. You just never, ever stop talking. Mm -hmm. Slightly different to group improvising where mm -hmm. you have to talk and then shut up. Listen, yeah. yeah. In, in the double act, it's very interesting because when I was in the double act, they're doing physical situation comedy because I was a street performer. Mm -hmm. And they, they, you notice that bit where he says to Eric, he says, can you, is it, can you get it working? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he goes, you what? Can you get it working? And he's just, he's looking for angles where he can get double entendres, something he can play, just go off in a different angle. He's always looking for that. He finds that more fun. You can see when he, get, he gets an idea or he thumps him. Or he, yes. it's, it's just beautiful. And we as an audience are watching Eric just waiting to see where, what can he find. We just want him to find stuff. And I think there's the example you mentioned there when he asked him to repeat the line. I think you sometimes see that when, not sure whether the audience heard it the first time. Yeah. So just say, oh, what was that? So you say it again just to make sure the laugh is there. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing about them as well, I think, was their sort of training of just, you know, being on stage from a very early age is that when things went wrong, they just continued. They didn't stop and yeah. say, we better do that again. Because in the theatre, of course, when things go wrong, you can't stop. You have to carry on. I haven't seen that, that interview, the first one you did, where yes. they're sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, they seem so relaxed together. Mm. They, they really mm. did get on, didn't they? Yes, I mean, we, we, we'll talk about it later on. But yes, I, I, you know, there's sort of the standard interview question from the journalist would be at the time, you know, do you two get on? And they right. would sort of say, well, we, you know, we have our own separate families and stuff. And they, oh, so you're not with each other 24 hours a day, hoping that there was some sort of rift between them. But of course, there never was. Um, we're talking about, mentioned ad lib in there. We've got a couple of examples here of, because uh, although they, you know, they, they, they learnt the script meticulously, sometimes they also forget it. And let's have a look at a couple of examples of them getting out of difficulty. Hey, now listen, I'll tell you. No, listen, I'll tell you what. If I promise to do that play properly, that one there, if I promise to do it properly, no messing about, how does that grab you? This play? Yeah. Mm. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't do that again. <laughs> Can't you see what would happen if I told the public all about you? Hundreds of people would follow you all over the place, trying to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've missed a gem out, but it doesn't... Oh, we have a gem! Doesn't matter, though. No, we can do it next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> following me about all over the place, touching me, the people. The people touching you yeah. all over the place? Of course. <laughs> the no, I wouldn't say that. No. No, it's not people touching you all over the place. Did right? I say it wrong, did I? No, you said it right. Got a good laugh. All right. Yeah. We'd like to go off and come on again. No, no. Listen, nobody can advertise on the BBC. Even Lord Hill can't say what kind of pipe tobacco he smokes. That's no wonder. It's mine. <laughs> he is known along the powers of Corridor. Of Corridors of Power. <laughs> corridors of Power. Now, we don't forget, he walks backwards. Yes, he does. <laughs> that was me. That was me. <laughs> I, think, I think the moment where the paper hat just lands on his head there is an extraordinary happy accident you sometimes get in, a, in, in comedy, isn't it? It is beautiful. And you watch Ernie looks off, off stage, and, and, uh, but obviously they're just going to relax and go with it because they know these are golden moments. Just, yes. and, 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 it's, and it's like, I think they were the only people doing it. Everyone else was trying to do a show, trying to do a funny mm, show. Mm. They're actually trying to do a show that's sort of okay and then... Uh, things just keep breaking up. I think their focus as well is very much on the sort of the live audience that's there. Yeah. Um, and you saw it briefly in the in the huge ventriloquist style, I don't know if you noticed it, but when the doll's leg goes over the side, you actually see that they're built up, a, they're actually on a wooden stage, it's two foot up. Right. Because they, they said they felt happier walking onto a wooden stage. But I, one of their, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, one of their great... Uh, uh, ambitions which they never really achieved was they wanted to make it big in America, but they, yeah. they, they never sort of, they, they, they never really did it. They, they played the Ed Sullivan show a lot of times, um, had made good impact on that, but then they'd sort of fly back home. Now, you've had some degree of success in the States. Uh, uh, a big what, degree. A big degree of success. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, and, um, sorry, um, uh, the researchers told me it was some. I know, well, the, the, the interesting thing is no one actually knows. I could say, I'm just so major in America. You know, no one actually knows, because I didn't know Morecambe and Wise had been there yes, and done yeah. eight, 18 shows. But, but you have done, I mean, you have done very well in the States. So what, what have you done that, 
that they didn't do? Well, I just went there and stayed there until they gave in. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this was the trick. I, I analysed it. I'm very military with my uh, approach. Transvestite with a career, you've kind of mm. got to be. Yeah. So I worked out that if you did a TV series, it could fail. You could do a film, it could fail. Uh, the clubs, you could get lost. Go to New York and just play a small theatre over and over again until the New York Times gave you a big thumbs up, mm. and, and that was the technique I used. I, I did the, the north face of the Iger route, which I prefer because it's, you know, it's real grand, grassroots stuff. I think in uh, one of your films, Ocean, is it Ocean 13, you mentioned Morecambe and Wise? Well, that's actually the right, that's Steven Soderbergh. Oh, is it? That's Steven Soderbergh being a, a Brit fan. There's, there's a number of people who uh, are into our comedy from way back, and mm. they, they mention it. Like, go, um, what is it? It's, it's, it's a reference, yeah, as big as Morecambe and Wise, or uh, yes. some reference to that, which come, looks like it's coming from me, it's coming from Stephen Soderbergh oh, right, and, okay. the, and the writers. Well, Eddie, thank you very much for, 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 for okay. helping us to look at some of those clips. Ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Izzard! <laughs> One of the many acts that knew Eric and Ernie well during the 1950s was the legendary Bruce Forsyth. I recently had the chance to ask him about those days. Bruce, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, tribute to Eric and Ernie. My pleasure. Um, and of course, you knew Morgan and Wise in the 1950s, didn't you, before they became particularly famous? Yes, I, I worked on the bill with Eric and Ernie several times, mm. and I always saw their potential. They were always one of the acts I would always stand on the side and, and watch their timing. And I always admired the way they bounced off one another. There was a a stardom there, although it was years before they mm. got their big break. There seems to be a sort of a, a thought as a feeling as well that in, in, in the 1950s there was still a, quite a big American influence in what they were doing. They were big fans of Abbott and Costello and, and there was a sort of, that sort of fast sort of cross-talk act and the push-in and all that kind of thing. Was that something that you remember them being like that then or? Uh, yes, and, and of course the big double act of the time, British double act, who were quite American in their style, was Jewel and Warris. Yes, yes. Are you you, you yes. know their name? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, good, yes, well yes. done. Well ben done. Morris, Jimmy Jewell. Yeah, good. Do you want to go for the car? Yeah. <laughs> no, we already, you've already won my car. No, but Jewel and Warris were, were the biggest mm. double act of the time. And the, in, funnily enough, in, sh in show business in those days, there was only room for one big double act. There were never, you know, to, to be really big in this country, there was only one big mm. double act. And Jewel and Warris were the double act for years and years and years until Eric and Ernie came on, on the scene. And as television was coming in and developing through the mid-50s, was there a feeling that television was the enemy of, of the Variety Act? Because oh, yes. Oh, yeah, you could be... Uh, I mean, I was advised so much uh, uh, before I got the job at the Palladium that, the, uh, that if you went on television, too much that you could be finished because you, your stage act would be seen or people would get too used to you. You mm. could be, they used to call it overexposed. <laughs> yes. And yes. I've never been overexposed. Have you not? <laughs> no. There's still couple, time. I've been accused of it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been accused of it but never actually sort of, uh, never came to a court case. Mm. And a few years after that you were headlining, doing your own show at the Palladium and they were, they were a supporting act for you, weren't they? In the that, right. mid-60s, mid-64, something That's like right. that? That's right, yes. It was when I did a show called every night at the Palladium mm. and I was the full top of the bill and I was uh, Eric and Ernie, Teddy Johnson and Pearl Carr and it was during that season that Eric and Ernie their new series started on television mm. and they got a nice applause you know when they came on but when the television series started after two or three weeks they really got into the people and the people had got to love them mm. in that two or three weeks and they were looking forward to the rest of their series, the applause that they got when they came on was incredible. And mm. that's when mm. I knew mm. that Eric and Ernie were going to be big time mm. at last. Mm. Stand there, yes. <laughs> no, 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 excuse me, but you're, you're playing all the wrong notes. <laughs> no, I, I'm playing them all the right notes. What? They're not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> the wonderful Bruce Forsyth there. In 1968, Eric and Ernie signed to the BBC. After their first series here, Eric suffered a heart attack. 
Convinced that Morecambe and Wise would never return to television, Sid Green and Dick Hills, their then writers, signed to do their own show with ATV. Eric and Ernie needed new writers, and they came in the shape of one man, a man who wrote the golden age of Morecambe and Wise. It's an honour to have him this evening. Will you please welcome Mr Eddie Braben! <laughs> Eddie, um, before we start, um, I believe this is a bit of an emotional return to the BBC studios for you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, overwhelming, really. It's uh, 31 years since we last here, recording the last Morgan and Wise Christmas show. And, uh, And tell me, how, when, did you, when did you first see Morecambe and Wise on stage? I hesitate to say this, but I was 15, 16, mm -hmm. and they were at the Liverpool Empire, and I went along with 1,200 other people. The place was packed, not a seat to be had, uh -huh. and they were awful. They were dreadful. They were about 19 or 20, and they were learning. Mm -hmm. And people were sitting there saying, who are they? Nobody ever heard of Morecambe and Wise. In fact, they were so far down the bill, I thought they were the, the, the printers. <laughs> <laughs> so, and years later, when we spoke about this, they, they said, yes, but we were learning. Mm, mm, you got to mm, learn some way. Mm. Well, you mentioned what they, what they were like before you, you started working. Well, let's have a look at a clip of Eric and Ernie, and this is uh, when they were working with ATV, and this is from 1966. Well, we can do all our little jokes together, no, can't no, we? No. Dickie happens to be the same size as me, and I'm tired of looking up at you all the time. You give me a pain in the neck. You don't do a lot for me, you know that, do you? I can bend down to your size, look. Hey. Ah, you can't walk about like that, though. Yes, I'll show you. Look, he looks good. All right. Announce me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Morecambe. Look at that. What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> you look good. You look like Groucho Marx. That's <laughs> ah, silly. You can't do that. No. Oh. Stupid. Well, how are you? You stand up on your toes. That'll do it. You'll get up to my height, then. Stand up on your toes. Go on. On your toes. Stand up. Stand up on your toes! I'm standing on my toes! You're not, are you? Yes! You must have tiny little toes. <laughs> I've got little short, fat, hairy ones. <laughs> There's a quite a sort of aggressive thing going on between them there, isn't there? What it didn't show was the, the warmth, the affection and the charm mm. of these two men, which I saw right away. And so did you no. think, if I can get that yes. warmth that yes. they do... Yes. If I get the, the warmth and the affection and make it funny, it might work. Mm. It might, we might have something special. Mm. And it did work, mm. and it was special. Absolutely. Now, I, I mean, one of the ideas I know, which I think you had some difficulty in persuading them, was the, was the bed sequences, yeah. where they would be in I bed could together. I could never, ever understand why they wouldn't have the bed scene. Mm. Nobody was keen on... In, I was so naive, I couldn't see anything wrong with two men being in bed. Mm. <laughs> I really couldn't, couldn't yeah. see anything wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, just a few minutes ago, we saw two men sharing a pair of trousers. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, that's, that's called the credit crunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is the very first bed seat you've got anyway. This, uh, anybody's place? <laughs> Do you mind if I, uh... No, no, no. Eric Morecambe. Anyway. How are you? Nice to see you. About! Thanks for inviting me into your bed. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> It's been a grand day for it, hasn't it? <laughs> grand day for what? Well, it all depends what you've been doing. <laughs> Do you fancy a rehearsal? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Do you fancy a rehearsal? No, no. I'm too tired, really. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've got next week's script. It's very funny. Have they sent us a wrong one again? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say anything, but the birds are moving again. <laughs> I mean, <there's> a... <laughs> Thank you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> something else as well. That oh, was a lovely mental picture you showed there. <laughs> You're all right, <laughs> <laughs> 
there was also some other element that you brought in as well. So as well as sort of making, making them a warmer couple on screen, um, you, you expanded Ernie's role greatly, didn't you, with the, making him a playwright? Made Ernie the pompous author. Mm. And what was his reaction to that? How did he feel about He was that? overjoyed. Was he? He was thrilled. He said, at last he said, I've got something I can, I can really get my teeth into, really... Mm. I can do something with this part. I can, I can perform. Mm. And he did. Mm. I remember. And Eric said to me, well, I, after one particular sketch, I said to Eric, I said, Eric, he was good. He said, for God's sake, don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> but he was good. Make, being the pompous author. And it also gave Eric something to bounce off. Mm. Mm. He would say to Ernie, Ernie's writing the play. Another belter? Not really. Struggling with this one. And words fall from your pen. Like pearls from a broken necklace. <laughs> you could be another George Bernard Priestley. <laughs> sure. Positive. <laughs> I can't tell you any what an honour it is to hear me hear me sitting next to you and talking to you. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, the other I... line he said, which I love, the other line he said, and you could be, you could be another Bronte sister. I can't sing. <laughs> no, but you've got the legs for it. <laughs> well, we're talking about the plays there. Let's have a look at a selection of some of the plays what Ernie wrote. Here we are. Sir Ernie! What a fine actor this boy is. He likes a girl. Oh, is it? Yes. Got a full move from here. <laughs> you must be glad to be back from your travel. Got a cold? I must ask you, Sir Eric. Tell me about your doings. <laughs> Well, do I tell him or do I just get up and go? What did His Majesty ask you? He wants to know about what they're doing. What news of Carlisle? They won 3 1. I sit alone and the firelight flickers. <laughs> and I think of you in your navy blue cardigan. That's a cardigan! That's a cardigan! Out of this house. <laughs> Father, have you no mercy? And I think of you in your navy blue cardigan. Yeah, dirty devil. <laughs> now, it's all beginning to make sense. <laughs> you realise what this means, don't you? <laughs> well, they'll never get away with it. Of course, it's a long shot, but it might just work. Anyway. Forensic will tell us. Hold you in my dreams. <laughs> This deadly serpent will put an end to my misery by biting me on the breast. <laughs> Could I have a word with you, please? Yeah. <laughs> Is that official? Yes, it's all in the play. The snake comes out of the basket and bites her on the breast. Yes. Fine. End it for me now! Ready when you are, Polly? <laughs> When, when you were, uh, comedy is notoriously uh, short-lived. Yeah. What's funny last week isn't funny this week. But every so often something comes along, like Laurel and Hardy, like Morecambe and Wise, which becomes timeless. And we can say for certain now that 30 years after the event, Morecambe and Wise were as funny as they ever were, and ever will be. Uh, and it's an extraordinary achievement. And it must be gratifying, I imagine, that you played such a large part in this, and to see stuff that you worked so hard on all those years ago still getting huge laughs. It's all very, it's overwhelming to be quite honest. Um, to realise, which I didn't realise then, because I was so involved in everything, mm. how important it was mm. to so many people. Mm. Um, but now, but now I can see it now and I, could, I can appreciate it now, but I couldn't appreciate it then.
you, you, you wrote the show for, for, for many, many years. I suppose one of the keys to, to, to coming up with that amount of material is to try and find a running gag, a situation that you can come back to in sketch form week in and week out. Yeah. And the one I'm thinking of, as I was very uh, fond of, were the two monks that they used to portray. I'm glad you said that because they were my favourites as well. Oh, were they? I really enjoyed the two monks, yes. And Eric and Andy liked them because they didn't have to learn any words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a, let's have a look at uh, an example of uh, one of Eddie's, uh, and Eric and Ernie's two monk sketches. feature of Eric and Ernie's show was the musical interlude and why should tonight be any different? Here are the two boys with singer Nina, one half of Danish Calypso sensation, Nina and Frederick. Now, could we take it from the top, Nina, the banana boat song? Right. right. Dad! Hold it, son. <laughs> Before we go any further, yes. I can't find the hole to blow down thee. <laughs> I can't find the hole to blow down these. Neither can I. <laughs> you don't blow them, you shake them. Now there's a novelty. <laughs> Are we ready, Nina? Yes. Can we take it from the top? Right. Right, let's go now. Banana boots. <laughs> day, Miss Eddie. Is she all right? Yes. Oh. <laughs> As a boat son. <laughs> Has she forgotten the words? Have you forgotten the words? No, I haven't. Because we can't have them written for you on a card in Danish. <laughs> in bacon rhyme to make you feel at home. Listen. Yes. You are not making a sound. At one point, I was definitely overdoing it. <laughs> they are supposed to go like this. Now, let me show you. You are good. Try it again. Thank you. <laughs> Ready when you are, Nina. Right. Work one night and I drink a bread. Daylight come and, and everyone go home. <laughs> <laughs> I must be honest. I'm having trouble with mine. <laughs> this is terrible. I think she's doing quite well. <laughs> Not Nina, you. How do you fancy a tambourine? I'll eat anything. <laughs> this is... What happened then? Not a lot. <laughs> oh, <darn it. laughs> this is a drop ditch. <laughs> this is a tambourine. How does he do it? Now, can we try it once again? Ready when you are, Polly? All right. Thank you, Nina. It's a six foot, seven foot, eight foot boy. Oh! Daylight come. You are not getting it right, are you? <laughs> Do that again. <laughs> now the hand. <laughs> I'll wait one more song.
Have you quite finished? There's not a lot left to shake. <laughs> a one, two, a one, two, three, four. Come, Mr. Tallyman, tell him you can now. Ladies and gentlemen, the guest stars keep coming. Will you please welcome Mr. Jack D? <laughs> Jack, welcome to the show. What are your earliest memories of, of Morecambe Wise? My, my real early memory was the, was the paper bag trick and oh, being yes. absolutely obsessed with that and wanting to know how to do it. Of course, my brother mastered it straight away and I, and I couldn't. He's, Is you your know, brother older than you? Four years younger. Oh, right. No. <laughs> I was giving you an out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's five years older in my defence, but uh, uh, I, I, and I've, I've always loved that, the simplicity of that. Mm -hmm. it's just did you ever master it? Yes. Have you, yes, have you, did, did you, uh, have you brought a brown paper bag I with did. you? I brought shows? a brown paper bag with me, and uh, I mean, if you'd like, I could. It's not an ordinary paper bag, obviously. It's, uh, it's a special one, and I um, pay quite a lot for it. <laughs> On eBay? Yeah. eBay. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Um, uh, the only thing I haven't got is an invisible ball. So... Okay, I've got a, I've got a, I've got an invisible ball here. I think. Okay, shall I give it a bounce? Yeah. Okay, please. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I think it's only fair we should see Eric and Ernie doing it as well. Here's Eric Morgan. The world of comedy that we grew up working with, uh, in the, you know, comedy clubs and stuff, basically you've got a bare stage, you haven't yeah. got the theatrical curtains business. Um, a lot of their sketches that have the theatrical curtains, I, I think, are, are very strong because it gives you a chance to, to see something quickly emerge from behind. Yeah, it's a great device, you know, because you've got, you've got the curtain and there's, there's tension because you know there is something behind, something's going to happen, Eric's going to turn up uh, and come from it. And... Uh, I, I just look back, I don't, I don't think anyone else would have got away with doing that so mm. often. You would have tired of it quite easily, you wouldn't have had the patience to watch it, but because you knew Eric was going to turn up or, or there was going to be something behind the curtain, it was always just a, such a clever, simple device. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, have, let's have a look at a couple of examples of some of the curtain gags that they did. You've got a job? Yeah. What sort is it? Siberian puddle maker. Have <laughs> <laughs> you seen him? No. I've got a good for you. No, don't bother. Oh, don't I don't want to see him. him. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd now like to take a trip down memory lane. What's that? Come on, let's have it. Hey, you're that's not going to Come on, what's going on? I've got a whole bunch of kids. Frankie, don't bring him on here. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, and what are you doing? Is annoyed. <laughs> half a star gets annoyed. Yes. Watch out. <laughs> I mean, when, we, when we started off, um, we were both used to being sort of solo stand-ups. Um, a double act, of course, is a different thing. Uh, mm. How important do you think uh, Ernie was to, to the relationship? Re I, you know, really important. I think what Ernie brings... Was when Eric Morgan is such a, a sort of powerful comedy engine, as it were, and I think to have, to have Ernie there as, as something to, to bounce off was, was, was really, really important because Ernie is not just a straight man. He had a straight agenda all the time, and I think that was what, what, what I always loved about it. And, in fact, what he had to say was always sufficiently interesting. I think, oh, actually... I would quite like to see this play and then of course Eric would come in and undermine it and I think that was what was uh, was made made Eric Morgan just work so well against mm. that mm. yeah yes quite because Eric's reaction has to depend on a solid base that Ernie is setting yeah. out there, isn't yeah. it? in the domestic scenes they do uh, when the two of them Eric and Ernie are sitting around in, in, in the coffee table and, and looking out the window and all that sort of stuff I always had the desire to be one of those people that was knocking on the door did you ever have oh, that it would have been it? lovely wouldn't it yeah just to have that uh, to, to come in and be part of the scene all of a sudden would have been absolutely fantastic mm, yeah, mm, yeah mm. All of those. and the people say that worked on the shows they were very sort of welcoming and you know, they, they made you feel good um, let's have a look at a couple of those uh, domestic settings um, the first one I think features Fenella Fielding I don't know what it is about this lovely little fellow but 
Whenever I see him, something deep down inside of me goes. <laughs> I adore elderberry wine. Ah, you haven't tasted elderberry wine until you've tasted my elderberry wine. <laughs> They might turn your teeth a little black, but you can't spit the pits anymore. <laughs> that was, of course, Glenda Jackson there. And ladies and gentlemen, please help me to thank Mr. Jack D. <laughs> of all the sketches that Eric and Ernie did, the one they considered the best we've already seen in an earlier version, Grieg's Piano Concerto. But the man who helped to make it the masterpiece it is was Andre Previn. I recently spoke to him in London. How did you first get contacted by Morecambe and Wise to appear on their show? Well, <clears throat> they had a, a, a kind of a permanent producer, mm. but he was a great friend of John Culshaw, who was the head of BBC Two for a while, and who was a very famous classical uh, music director mm -hmm. uh, and producer. And he knew me very well, and he called up and he said, look, I, I don't suppose you'll say yes, but do you know who Morecambe and Wise are? I said, of course I know who they are. He said, well, they would like you to be a guest on the show. And as soon as I found out, found out it wasn't a send-up, you know, uh, I said, I'd love it. I'd love it. Let's give a warm welcome to the principal conductor from the London Symphony Orchestra, Mr. Andre Previn. You're the principal conductor of the London Symphony yeah. Orchestra. Serious musician, serious composer. Yeah. Some people would have thought, well, I've got everything to lose by appearing on the Morecambe and Wise show. Oh, no, no, I, I, that wouldn't have occurred to me. It's... Uh, you know, to work with great people in whatever uh, discipline they happen to be is always a treat. And uh, I was really looking forward to it. And uh, Eric was very sweet. He told me later that he was worried about things like timing mm. and all mm. that. Mm. But that the first time I read a joke, he thought, oh, we're home and dry. Does a musician's timing help in, in, in comedy timing? Is it, it's all about I have known a lot of unfunny it? musicians. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. And a lot so. of comedians who can't play instruments. <laughs> yes. But, uh, well, they made life very easy, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, I was just having a good time. Were you aware that something special was happening while you were in the middle of it? Or? No. No, no. I, I didn't think that, I mean, the fact that it's been played how many times? Almost every year. Well, it's very been voted the, um, by people on the show as mm. their favourite Morecambe and Wise sketch is, 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 is the uh, Andrew Preview. Yeah. <laughs> Say hello to Mr. Preview. Ah, Mr. Preview, how are you? I do assure you, Mr. Preview. Privet. Privet. Don't go, Mr. Preview. I can Privet. Privet. <laughs> Believe me, you're in for a surprise, Mr. Preview. Previn. Privet. Privet. Pri uh, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why it's considered perhaps the, the, their greatest moment is because you, principal mm -hmm. conductor of the LSO, being grabbed by the collar, being told that he's playing all the right notes but not necessarily in the right order. Yeah, that's a great job. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's your bemusement, which I think is just that extra little ingredient in the whole thing, which just makes it a, a, a very special piece. Well, you know, to be with Eric and Ernie was a great flattery. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Greek by with him and him. <laughs> So they're wrong with the violins? No, no, there's nothing wrong with the violins. That's only your opinion. <laughs> what, 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 what were you playing just then? The Greek piano concerto. <laughs> but, but, you're, you're playing, you're playing all the wrong notes. playing all the right notes, <laughs> but not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that, sunshine. <laughs> uh, 
Now, thanks to Andre Previn there. Ladies and gentlemen, of all the guest stars that have ever appeared on the Morecambe and Wise show, no one created a bigger impact than our next guest of this evening. Let's see her in action. A report on the economy has just come through from number 11 Downing Street. The Chancellor's statement reads as follows. There may be trouble ahead, but while there's moonlight and music and love and romance... one of the most famous moments in British television. Um, so I'm told, yes. I have to say, it was lovely actually standing in the wings waiting to come on to see Andrew Preview and the boys in the band because yes. I've actually always felt that that is the funniest of all of the sketches that they I, did. I, 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 one of the things I particularly like when you watch it over and over again is the musicians' reactions in the background. Yes, Because, yes. you know, because the, the famous conductor is being roughed up a bit. But Andre just sort of stood there with that wonderful deadpan face. Yes. He was the perfect straight man for that particular gag. I think he was just Well, wonderful. it's interesting you say that because he asked for a bit of advice and the two bits of advice Eric gave to him was he says, well, um, first of all, if we start ad-libbing, listen to what we're saying. But secondly, don't find it funny. <laughs> keep it straight. So whatever we do, just keep it straight, because you get that extra laugh with, yeah. you know, with a look of bemused, this horror, you know. It, it's, yeah. If he was laughing, you, you, you'd lose uh, so much. He but did it brilliant. He did he it did. absolutely brilliantly. Mm. But to put your appearance into a context, mm. um, now in television we used to see newsreaders popping up in jungles or, or, or whatever, you know, the, the, uh, for want of a better word, the celebrity is no longer seen in one situation. Boy, what did I start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a serious newsreader in 1976, I believe it was, mm. when you first did that. How were you first approached? As it happens so very often, just by a telephone call. Mm -hmm. I got a call from Ernest Maxim, who was their producer at the mm -hmm. time, who said, um, the boys would like you to be on their Christmas show. And I, I think it took about, uh, about ten minutes for me to come down off the ceiling, because at that time, they were absolutely at the top of their profession. They were the, the, the two most famous men on television, the mm. two funniest men on television. Mm. I was at that time quite well known because I was, I was reading the 9 o'clock news, so I had quite a high profile. And they'd started this tradition of having someone do something out of the box mm, mm. as a guest mm. at the sort of very end of their major Christmas show. So they had Glenda Jackson doing the, the famous bit with Cleopatra. Mm. They had Andre doing the thing with Andrew Preview and the so boys So famous the band. people, but not necessarily doing what they're no, famous for. completely mm. out of the box. Mm. And Ernest Maxson, you mentioned him there. He, he, he was one of the, the two main producers they had at the BBC, John Ammons being the other one. And these, these two guys were, were very, very important to the mm. whole uh, career of Eric and Ernie, weren't they? Very much so. And, I mean, the, the great thing about Ernest Maxson um, I always felt that he was Gene Kelly personified because mm -hmm. you know how Gene Kelly, a wonderful, wonderful American dancer, he had, he had a particular way of moving when he was dancing. And Ernest uh, had been a dancer and is and was a great choreographer. And it was wonderful working with him because he was great for the guys mm. because they, neither of them were, they were hoofers. Yes. And uh, Ernie particularly was a hoofer. Mm. He was a good tap dancer. Mm. And Eric sort of kind of joined in. Mm. And I think that Ernest Maxson was brilliant for them because he choreographed to their strengths mm. and mm. did what made them look really good. So when we actually came to, to do the routine, that was what he did. Well, let's have a look at some of uh, Ernest Maxson's routines that he put together for Morgan and Wise. 
Like in the rehearsal room, when you got to meet them uh, and, and started work on the routine, what were, what were your immediate impressions? That was the great thing about them. I mean, I'd never met them up until then, obviously. And I think the wonderful thing about Eric and Ern was that although they were such great stars, they were fab people. They were just as lovely in real life, yes. if you like, yeah. away from their act as they were when they were performing. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about them was that even though their Christmas show got the biggest ratings, the biggest audiences of the year, they made you, as someone who was appearing in their program, feel as if you were the most important mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. They seem to have a great uh, affinity with, 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 with the female guests particularly, I think. Have a look. <laughs> It's your vertigo. Just your, it's wings, isn't it? No. I, 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 heights. Heights. Oh, as well. Yes. Heights. Yeah. You get down there, well, and if I, I, if I could, yeah, and me. I'll come down, and she'll climb down. Yes. I'm sorry I about this. Climb down there in this I, in this my dress. Hand, my hand. Where is it? It's, it's, oh, it's where it shouldn't be. I can't get down there in this dress. Oh, well, do something with the dress, love. Well, you must know, yes, do something. It's with especially the... me. You yes, I realise. <laughs> Just climb down here. I really don't like that. No, no, no. Oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. Can, now, can you get that way? Yes. Down. Yes. I'll hold on to anything that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Dignity at all times. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you can. Yes. Just try a little. This one. No, no, no. <laughs>
after, after you made your extraordinary appearance on, on the Morecambe Wise show, I, I imagine the public reaction would, would, have been, would have been quite strong because as a newsreader, it would be assumed that you didn't have legs, you'd be walking around on casters. So um, what was the reaction? Um, it, yes, it was. It was pretty intense um, because I, I suppose up until then, newsreaders had been very very much within their box, mm -hmm, being mm -hmm. very serious, mm -hmm. and quite right too, because news is a serious business. Yes. But I think that Eric and Ern, they realized that it was possible to take people out of the straitjacket of what they were particularly known for, and give them an opportunity to show that they had another side to their mm -hmm. character and their nature. And in fact, I mean, to this day, literally, I still get people shouting, Eren, show us your legs! <laughs> <laughs> and, and people, literally come up to me, I think, two, three, five, ten times a week mm. and ask the perennial question, what was it like to work with Morecambe and Wise? And uh, I don't know how many times I've been asked that question over the last 30 years, hundreds, thousands of times. And people very often now, because it's such a long time ago, will say, you, you must get fed up with being asked this. And actually, no, I don't, because I take it as an enormous compliment, because... I think they were comic geniuses. Mm. Neither of them are with us now. They were lovely guys. They were wonderful to work with. They were as funny off screen as they were on. They were gentlemen. They were lovely, lovely people. Yeah. And I think, you know, that the magic of videotape as well is we can look back at it and the selections we've shown tonight mm. have got as big a laugh here in front of the audience as they did back in the 70s. So they will never die. They timeless. will always be with us. Genius, Ladies and gentlemen, timeless. Angela Rippon. At the end of every programme, Eric and Ernie would finish on a song, the best loved of which was Bring Me Sunshine. Of all the many times they sung it, this is my personal favourite, because I think this looks like a second take. Somebody's forgotten the lyrics the first time round. Have a look as Eric walks forward and he shakes his head. I think somebody has definitely forgotten the lyrics, because that then explains the unique delivery of this song. Have a look. Bring me sunshine in your smile Bring me laughter all the while in this world where we live. In this world where we live, there should be more happiness. So much joy, so much joy you can give to each and a bright tomorrow. Make me happy through the years. Never bring me, never bring me, never bring me any tears, any tears. Any tears. Let your arms be as warm. Pardon? Let your arms be as warm. As the sun from up above, bring me fun, bring me sunshine, bring me, sunshine. Bring me love. From all of us here, thank you for watching. And thank you, Eric and Ernie. Bring me sunshine. Go to BBC iPlayer and listen again to Paul O'Grady presenting a special Radio 2 tribute to Bill Cotton, the man who transformed British television. Starring Kurt Russell, the disaster movie remake Poseidon is on BBC One tonight at 10.40. Bring me sunshine, bring me love. Hey. Now there's another thing. <laughs>